May I bring the meeting to order, ladies and gentlemen? Je déclare la réunion ouverte. Excellencies, dear colleagues, uh, representatives of uh, academia and civil society, it is uh, a great honor to welcome you to our debate today on the important role of South-South and Triangular Cooperation in creating space for developing countries to share and exchange development solutions, policy choices, business models, and cooperation technologies. Uh, this event today will focus on how South-South cooperation can leverage knowledge exchange, technology transfer, and tested solutions for accelerated development uh, results. It gives me, gives me great uh, pleasure to note that the event is co-organized by the permanent mission of Uganda uh, to the United Nations and uh, UNDP. The Sustainable Development Goals explicitly call for South-South and Triangular Cooperation to play a catalytic role in ha harnessing existing expertise and solutions towards the implementation of Agenda 2030, and this makes South-South and Triangular Cooperation an effective mechanism for facilitating exchanges of knowledge about viable development solutions that have been tested elsewhere and before innovations and solutions to address common development challenges in our efforts to accomplish the 2030 Agenda uh, for Sustainable Development. Please join me in welcoming to the podium our distinguished speakers for this afternoon's debate. His Excellency Ambassador Mr. Adonia Ayebare, the permanent representative of the Republic of Uganda to the United Nations, and as importantly, the president of the High Level Committee on South-South Cooperation. Welcome, Mr. Ambassador. Thank you very much for gracing us with your presence. Uh, Mr. Achim Steiner, the UNDP Administrator and Chair of the United Nations Development Group. Sir, thank you very much for your presence. Uh, Minister Gabriela Martinic, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Argentina to the United Nations. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for being here. Uh, Mr. Jorge Chediek, the UN Secretary General's Envoy on South-South Cooperation and Director of the UN Office for South-South Cooperation. Jorge, thank you very much for uh, uh, working with us uh, uh, on this, and His Excellency Ambassador Chong Hee Han, uh, uh, the uh, permanent representative of the Republic of Korea to the UN. Without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Ambassador Ayebare, uh, the PR of Uganda, to deliver his opening remarks. Your Excellency, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for giving me the floor. Um, Gabriel Martinez, a Deputy Permanent Representative of Argentina, the United Nations. Mr. Achim Steiner, UNDP Administrator and Chair of the United Nations Development Group. My friend, Hoj Shadek, Envoy of the Secretary General on South-South Cooperation and Director of the United Nations Office for South-South Cooperation. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, uh, colleagues, good afternoon and welcome to this event. I would like uh, to take this opportunity to thank UNDP for co organizing this event and for being a champion of cooperation and partnership across the Global South. Today, I'm wearing two hats. One, as the permanent representative of Uganda. Second, as the president of the High Level Committee on South-South Cooperation. And also another third hat as an African and fourth, as a father with very survival depends on how serious we deal with matters of sustainable development. The 2030 Agenda has provided us with opportunities to enhance new and inclusive global partnerships in which South-South and Triangular Cooperation is an integral part. In this effort, access to knowledge, experiences, innovation, and diverse sources of financing from across the South will be critical. The spirit of solidarity that inspires South-South Cooperation creates space for developing countries to share lessons on policy choices, business models, and technological in innovation. South-South cooperation is demonstrating great potential in boosting productive capacity, promoting technological transfer, and supporting industrialization of developing countries. The role of UNDP in providing a platform to bridge existing knowledge gaps and facilitate exchange of viable development solutions across the Global South cannot be overemphasized. 
excellencies, all developing countries, regardless of size or level of development, have accumulated capacities, success stories, and experiences which can provide cost-effective and replicable solutions to challenges faced, faced by other developing countries. <laughs> they are therefore in a unique position to identify and scale up tested, powerful, and cost-efficient development solutions of high relevance to other countries with similar realities. In Uganda, we have our knowledge of refugees management strategies, community empowerment through our rural development programs, and the work we have done in assisting conflict-affected countries in the region. This illustrates that if leveraged, the wealth of existing knowledge from countries of the South can be shared among the membership to create impact. The high-level committee on South-South cooperation remains available to support all initiatives that promote South-South and triangular cooperation and reach out to all stakeholders to chat away in identifying and sharing proven solutions that have meaningful impact on local communities in achieving SDGs to ensure that we leave no one behind. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for sharing these opening uh, remarks with us. I am now pleased to invite uh, Mr. Achim Steiner, the UNDP Administrator, to take the floor. Sir, you have the floor. Magdi, thank you very much, Excellencies. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to you and to you as President of the High Level Committee on South-South Cooperation, um, Ambassador Ayabare. Thank you very much for leading us off into what hopefully is an exchange that not only validates what I think every one of us in this room here would very quickly agree on, that South-South cooperation is not only something that is highly desirable, that has become part of our objectives and, and frameworks of working, but actually that is delivering real results already. And, you know, in, in listening to you just now, I was thinking in, in some ways, if you think of an entity such as UNDP today, the United Nations Development Program with a presence in 170 countries, then it is as much a platform for North-South and South-South and triangular cooperation as any institution could be because actually much of our expertise is already recruited out of the Global South. Secondly, much of the work that we trade on in terms of knowledge, best practice and policy reforms have been invented by one or other country in their national context. And what UNDP, as with other UN entities, we provide is really a, a knowledge exchange vehicle, a platform that at times then has to be augmented with capacity building, maybe with finance, with technology transfer. And in this very room here, we have had also discussions about the, the new technology, um, knowledge hubs and facilities that are being put in place. So I think one of the interesting questions is, have we moved on from having to put, first of all, a spotlight on nurturing and also reinforcing the importance of South-South cooperation to sitting together in the year 2017 and asking ourselves, well, what next? And a few days ago, I, I did say that, from my vantage point, South-South cooperation today is in the DNA of an entity such as UNDP, by no means exclusively. Many others carry that same DNA. But what I'm intrigued with is the question, how can we go to scale quicker and faster? Um, because we still have a transactional issue on the one hand, the time it takes to learn something in one place, country, context, legislative environment, and make it available to the rest of the global community or in the South-South context between countries of the Global South. I looked at the examples that are cited in uh, the notes that were prepared for me here. I mean, we, we drew on Kenya's experience with its National Commission on Human Rights and the network of African national human rights institutions, for example, in helping and advising Lesotho, the Kingdom of Lesotho's Human Rights Commission. Uh, another example given to me here is Kyrgyzstan sharing of Serbia's knowledge and experience with the investigation of crimes against, um, of violence against women and Kyrgyzstan's own efforts to establish a policy and legal framework. And indeed, today I was meeting with the foreign minister of Kyrgyzstan, and, and you know, one of the things that intrigues me is that in his country, the digital economy, both from an e-governance perspective as much as from a 
economic and developmental perspective is now a central plank of the, the years to come. And we were talking about an interesting connection between countries such as Estonia that have become very well known for their leadership in this field through Kyrgyzstan to Singapore, uh, Bangladesh and many other countries that are working on the frontier of this. And I think it is one of the interesting questions that in addition to thinking about how can we make knowledge move quicker and more efficiently and allow good practices to be scaled up at least as an available source to draw on, whether in policy, in technology, in financial and financing terms, how can we also rapidly address where the frontier of innovation is happening? Digital economy, I keep on referring to it, uh, the, the prospect of automation, of artificial intelligence, connectivity, um, are already shaping the way our economies will look tomorrow. And nations are across the globe sometimes ill-prepared and struggle to find points of access. So it's another area just to illustrate where concepts such as the Global South-South Mart also are perhaps a way of short-circuiting information, which is my final remark. The business model around which we need to think of, and I speak here now from a UNDP perspective, its role in facilitating and supporting and catalyzing South-South cooperation um, has to be taking advantage of contemporary opportunities that are different. The traditional model used to be you see something in one place, you transact it through an administrative institutional setting such as UNDP and turn it into a delivery package into another place. The timelines, the cost, the complexity are simply too heavy. We live in the age of the internet, of you know, Google and of many other facilities that allow us to search quickly. So is perhaps the value of an institution such as UNDP now to go beyond just saying, well, here are ideas, it is the validation, it is the assessment of efficacy, it is the relevance and suitability uh, that are elements that countries and governments will be looking for to us as UN institutions in order to allow South-South cooperation not simply to be a wave of fantastic ideas, but how on earth will you process them? How do you select the right ones for your country? And how do you also prioritize them in terms of national development efforts? And that's where I think I hope we as a UN development group, as a family of UN institutions, as much as UNDP itself also, um, are continuously together with the South-South Cooperation Office, um, sharpening our understanding of the frontier, but also the instruments and the platforms that we can use. Thank you so much for the invitation this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Administrator. I noted a shortcut to facilitation and perhaps the idea of vetting the value to deliver these solutions with uh, an added endorsement as, as how you see uh, what we're doing in Global Smart. Um, I would now like to invite Minister Gabriela Martinic, the DPR of Argentina, to the UN to deliver her opening remarks. Madam, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Martina Soliman, Ambassador Adebare, uh, Mr. Steiner, Mr. Tediek, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much for being here today. Uh, the adoption in 2015 of the 2030 Agenda, the Addis Abeba Action Agenda on Financing for Development, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change, and the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, reaffirm an ambitious agenda commitment to promoting sustainable and inclusive social, economic, and environmental development, which has a high impact in international cooperation. In order for the new agenda to be comprehensively implemented and not be merely an expression of ambitions, there is a need to further develop institutional capacities and mechanisms and to coordinate policies at all levels. In this context, it is still necessary to develop an analytical framework that articulates and coordinates different forms of international cooperation initiatives and consolidates the resources needed for implementing the 2030 Agenda. The main challenge in this process of implementation is to change our own mentality and our own way of thinking. We have to be very creative in designing our common actions and transcending divisions between the North and the South, public and private, political and academic, and being able to mobilize all stakeholders. 
As it is recognized in the Addis Abeba Action Agenda, we believe that multi-sectoral partnerships between the private sector, the public sector, and civil society are key tools for different developmental development actors to mobilize and exchange knowledge, expertise, technology, and financial resources. Forty years on from the adoption of the Buenos Aires Plan of Action, the increasing role of developing countries has translated into an increasingly multipolar international scenario. The traditional paradigm based on the undirectional north-south flow of cooperation can no longer explain this more complex, heterogeneous, and interdependent reality. The agendas, methodologies, and actors involved in the international development cooperation system are currently being redefined. The second United Nations high-level conference on South-South cooperation to be held in Buenos Aires in 2018 is a historic opportunity to reflect on the progress made and the results achieved in the past decades and to analyze the importance of current BAP approaches in light of recent developments. The key is to identify the challenges and opportunities of this new stage and build an architecture of international cooperation in which all countries participate based on their potential and competitive advantages and benefit according to their needs in line with the principle of leaving no one behind. The conference will be an opportunity to revalue our country's contribution to development through South-South cooperation actions and set up global support programs, measures, and policies that increase their impact scope and sustainability in the next years. We believe this form of cooperation is an effective means of implementation to achieve the SDGs and an exemplary partnership model for sustainable development. Just as the BAPA outlined in 1978, a horizon on which the countries work in an interim decades, the Conference on Buenos Aires provides a unique opportunity to identify national, regional, interregional, and global lines of action that should form part of the strategies of, gover of governments, regional agencies, and the United Nations system as, as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Martinez, and we're all looking forward to uh, the 2019 encounter and the continued leadership of Argentina on South-South cooperation, both intellectual and, and pragmatic uh, at both levels. Um, I would now like to invite our colleague, uh, Mr. Jorge Chediek, the Secretary General's Envoy on South-South cooperation and the Director of the UN Office for South-South cooperation to deliver his remarks. Jorge, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador Ayavari, President of the High-Level Committee of South-South Cooperation, Minister Martinich, Deputy Permanent Representative of Argentina, Achim Steiner, Administrator of UNDP and Great Leader in South-South and Triangular Cooperation, dear colleague Magdi martinez Soliman, Director of Bureau of Policy um, of UNDP. I was thinking while well, he was hearing the remarks that 20 years ago this would have been a very lonely meeting because South-South cooperation at the time was vindicated mostly as a political statement, mostly as a reaction to the patterns brought by North-South cooperation because we didn't have that much of a capital to be very proud of and we didn't have that much of an engagement and that much activity going on to highlight the contributions of South-South cooperation. Uh, I say that because lately, in the context of the preparation for the conference, I was rereading documents of 20 years ago, and it's really remarkable <coughs> how far we have come in considering South-South cooperation not just a political manifestation, which it is and it should remain, but also a, a real instrument to change the world. And what has changed in the last few years? First, countries of the South have shown that they can find their own ways to development. That we need not wait for the models of the North to find responses to the traditional development challenges. Countries like India, China, 
Brazil showing that with models that were not precisely those prescribed by the traditional development models to out of poverty hundreds of millions of people and achieved levels of uh, human development that basically jump stages based on what could have been expected. And I mentioned those countries, but there are many others, many of them represented in this room. One of them, the Republic of Korea, that many years ago was considered, at, after the war, one of the poorest countries on earth, and is one of the few that managed to go all the way to being a highly developed country, but without losing your spirit of a southern country. And we're really very grateful for your continued engagement. So going back 20 years ago, we were not there. The UN system was still in the model of North-South. We still thought that most of the answers came from the thinking and the practices of the Northern countries. Again, rereading the, pro the report of the South-South cooperation that we produce every year for the second committee, 17 years ago, we had five agencies reporting contributions to South-South cooperation. This year's report, we have 23 organizations that reported their engagement in South-South cooperation. So as the administrator has said, it has penetrated the DNA of the system because South-South cooperation is really resulting in best practices to change the world. As, in addition to being hosted very generously by UNDP, and I want to reiterate our gratitude to the administrator for his leadership and the support he gives to our work, we are engaged with UNDP in a network of southern think tanks. Because not only we have developed our own solutions, we, have, we are developing our own thinking. Three weeks ago, I was in Delhi for an event and there were 41 southern think tanks participating in only that event. And the network we jointly have with UNDP has over 200 think tanks that are working on development issues from a southern perspective. So we have an extraordinary capital of thinking. And in addition, we have an extraordinary capital of practices. In that context, I want to salute the initiative UNDP is undertaking by itself of establishing the initiative we're going to launch and present today, the Global S Smart program. Why? Because, as the administrator said, we have this capital, but sometimes we don't know or we have no way to access it. And by establishing and creating this public, global public good, UNDP makes available to member states, to international organizations, and to other partners responses to many of the development challenges that tailored to the realities of each country can really achieve very positive results. And through the extraordinary intermediation of UNDP and other agencies of the system, they can, make, they can become a reality. And I say that because of my 27 years with the UN, I was 25 years in the field with UNDP, and we put South-South cooperation in action, and it really yields excellent results. That's what I'm so proud to be associated with this practice. And I really would sometimes would have liked to have this tool and maybe would have found better answers so I would have avoided the reinvention of the wheel that sometimes we do. So I commend UNDP and I thank you for uh, this initiative that will facilitate the work of everybody. It will be incorporated in the portal we are creating, which is called UN South South, that also integrates other initiatives on sister agencies. And we look forward for this to being a shortcut for the South to help each other, to help, among, to help everybody among ourselves. And also we count on the support of the Northern countries to support triangular cooperations. And also they should continue to provide North-South cooperation. The fact that it's not, uh, uh, that I didn't mention doesn't mean that it should be neglected, that should remain a central part of the global architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chedic, for uh, that historical analysis and the forward-looking suggestions uh, uh, and, and, and this connection between South-South thinking 
and South-South practice, which I think is uh, uh, where, where the rubber hits the road. You, you mentioned in your, in your words the trajectory and the support we receive from the Republic of Korea as an important uh, uh, contributor in, uh, to many initiatives on South-South, in particular as a smart for SDGs. Uh, through uh, the launch of the first thematic window on community-led initiatives. We have already heard from our Colombian friends how they are learning through uh, uh, this, this window. So let me, without further ado, invite uh, Ambassador Han, the uh, uh, PR of Korea, to uh, deliver his remarks. You have the floor, Thank sir. Thank you, uh, McPhee and Mr. Kim Schneider, uh, for organizing this important meeting. I'm very honored to be invited to share uh, Korea's experience in this whole process. Korea uh, congrats once again the launch of A Smart for SDGs and its uh, first uh, thematic window on community-led development and UNDP's and partners' pivotal role in initiating and sustaining support for such a platform. We believe uh, in the potential of this global marketplace to accumulate, share, scale up uh, best practices of development solutions amongst South South partners as well as uh, with the wider development community. Korea uh, has had the privilege of supporting the inclusive and sustainable new communities initiative. And we are honored to have uh, two of our inclusive and sustainable new communities uh, project in Uganda and Vietnam shared on the SMART for SDG platform. A special envoy of uh, South South Corporation, uh, Mr. Chedik uh, already mentioned, Korea's uh, own experience trajectory is tantamount to the importance of inclusive and community-led development. In fact, Korea's own development experience in itself is close to South-South cooperation as the memories of our own development experience are still fresh uh, in our mind. I myself was born at times when Korea's GNI was uh, around 120 US dollars, uh, lagging even behind the, the least developed countries. Current global Korean companies like uh, Samsung uh, had begun as an export company selling dried fish, uh, vegetables, and fruit, and was then manufacturing base goods such as flour and confectionaries. It then made a transitional uh, transformation to manufacturing high-tech goods and software, as you see now, uh, electronics and uh, uh, cell phones and everything. Over the years, the Republic of Korea, through its development ex experience exchange program and knowledge sharing program, has shared its development experience with its developing partners. In 2012, uh, uh, Korea International Cooperation Agency, known as COICA, formulated internal strategy for triangular cooperation to realize the potential of South-South cooperation and has conducted a triangular cooperation project and joint training programs together with uh, Thailand, Indonesia, Turkey, Chile, Egypt, Mexico, Peru, and Colombia, and uh, many uh, regional organizations as well. Korea will continue to support South South and tri uh, trilateral cooperation, including those among former and present fragile and conflict afflicted nations. Uh, having said that, I'd like to share uh, my own uh, recommendation on three areas. First uh, area is, uh, as we see, uh, there is a science and technology-related platform uh, after financing for development agreement. First is uh, science, technology, innovation for sustainable development. Uh, we have regular meeting. Second is a technology facilitation mechanism uh, to include uh, this technology transfer with the uh, developing countries. And another uh, important you know, uh, discourse is a science policy interface. So all in all, uh, I encourage you know South South Cooperation Triangle Cooperation uh, mechanism or any you know initiative can join this uh, process so that uh, how this whole process can affect South South Cooperation or Triangle Cooperation. That's one recommendation. Second recommendation is uh, I was dealing with uh, as a chair of uh, UNCITRAL UN Commission on International Trade Law. They are working uh, very intensively to formulate standardized and uh, uh, modernized uh, rules and uh, uh, legislations to encourage uh, you know, uh, commercial activities and trade and commerce in th particular developing countries, micro, uh, small and medium enterprise and e-commerce. So uh, I think uh, 
South, South, in terms of South cooperation, many developing countries can pick up those uh, model law, uh, legislative guidance, and convention so that uh, you can encourage uh, you know, uh, small and medium enterprise activities and commerce and uh, trade uh, to, to increase your uh, you know, revenues and, and job uh, opportunity. Third point is, as Korea is a leading a peace building commission, like a sustaining peace concept, to promote uh, you know, uh, uh, peace uh, after like a post-conflict process. Uh, this is a very important process. Uh, we continue to have to continue to build the sustainability and institution building and rule of law, good governance, so that uh, we can prevent you know, any possible recurrence of conflict uh, in any society. So I think uh, we have a linkage of goal 16 uh, of a peaceful society uh, and, and so we need a peace development nexus as much as possible. Uh, so I encourage you, UNDP, to continue to study this concept in a more professional manner. Uh, how all UNDP's work can be uh, you know, uh, related or how you can contribute this whole peace building or sustaining peace process uh, in a much proactive way uh, than before. Uh, of course, you know, in this context, South-South cooperation and triangle cooperation can also join this whole important discourse because, uh, you know, UN is now discussing all, always uh, integrating holistic approach, how peace development and humanitarian assistance uh, can be uh, combined and interconnected. So this is uh, my uh, recommendation to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Han. I think you've helped us connect the South-South dots to uh, a number of other initiatives and, and, and streams of work. The nexus, peace and humanitarian action, uh, the connection to trade, and the normative contributions to South-South facilitation, which you, you exemplified with, with the work of UNCITRAL. Thank you very much for your contribution. I would like to also thank all the panelists for theirs, for their remarks and for having set the tone for the technical discussion that will follow. But before that, we have a short video that illustrates knowledge of the South for the South. I hope technology will not betray us and we will be able to see it. No, it actually works. Leaders adopted the Sustainable Development Goals to end poverty, protect the planet, and increase peace and prosperity. However, while considerable progress has been made, it remains insufficient to fully meet the SDGs by 2030. Concrete actions are needed to lift the 767 million people who still live on less than one US dollar and 90 cents a day. The UN Secretary General highlighted the rapid evolution of alternative forms of development cooperation including the scaling up of South-South cooperation, is beginning to suggest bold, innovative means to strengthen cooperation to deliver the SDGs. With more than 60 years of experience in development, there's an enormous wealth of knowledge on a wide variety of models, policies, political and institutional arrangements and technologies tailored specifically to the circumstances of a very diverse set of countries. When we transfer this knowledge from South to South, we do cooperation, a very uh, specific cooperation. An example of these powerful South-South exchanges is the UNDP's Global Environment Facility Small Grants Program, partnership with Barefoot College in India through which illiterate women from local communities in Africa, Asia, and Latin America have received training in India to become solar engineers, as well as financial and technical support to electrify their villages upon their return. As a result, 71 women have become solar engineers bringing light to more than 22,739 people in 52 villages across the world. The Women Solar Engineer Project is a powerful example of SAF-SAF and triangular cooperation.
Another inspirational development solution is the Kingdom of Morocco's program to improve the detainment conditions of incarcerated persons and support their reintegration into society. This innovative approach of using peer educators enabled the training of 220 detainees who as of now sensitized some 11,000 inmates. The approach of detainee peer education to deconstruct the radical discourse in the detention centers has drawn the attention and the interest not only of countries in West Africa but also in Europe. Over the span of a year, 400 men and 100 women received vocational training and jobs. UNDP is committed to leveraging this wealth of knowledge and know-how from the South and make it available to all development stakeholders on an open source basis, in other words, for free. We have developed a global solutions exchange called SS Smart for SDGs, an open sourced and end-to-end -end system that supports partners from the South to package and exchange their demands and solutions. SS Smart is collaborating with UN agencies such as WFP and external partners to help package development solutions, feature demands at country level, and broker matches between solution seekers and solution providers. South, South, and Triangular Cooperation continue to grow as a driving force that will help move forward the development agenda as part of our role in leading the high-level committee on South-South cooperation. We are calling on all partners to help identify and share proven solutions that have meaningful impact at the local level in order to contribute to the achievement of the SDGs at the global level. To collaborate with SSMART, contact us at global-ssmart.org. Thank you very much, colleagues, and I think the, the video really exemplifies the, the potential and also the, the energy and the power behind taking these country-level experiences, knowledge and expertise, and really transferring them, scaling them up within regions and also very much across regions. And it's really been our honor as UNDP to be able to support this for that process, but also really as a mechanism to bring together other development partners, very much integrate also across the UN system really is a, is a very uh, common service, if we can call it that, for that scale up of those experiences. I think the video is also a very nice segue between the panel that we've just had and the experiences and the perspectives that have just been shared to our next panel, which is more, if I can call it, at the technical level of experience sharing. And we have four very exciting examples that some of which have already been referred to, but of those bottom-up country-level experiences that we feel very much there's a power, there's the interest and potential to learn from more. So without further ado, I would like to uh, begin the second panel. I think if our let me just uh, touch base with our sitting panelists if we need to, to change seats or if we can continue. Wonderful. Thank you very much. It's very, yep. you're welcome. So if I can invite the, the speakers for the next panel up to the front. We'll just take one minute for the, the change in seating. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues, and let me, uh, I'm delighted to introduce this next panel. 
As I mentioned at the outset, this is really our opportunity to hear very specific examples that we can, that are showcased from the development solutions that have been identified by the national partners on the ground, where we know and we think that there's interest to scale those up and to share those with other experiences. We'll be hearing a, a brief introduction and overview from each of the panelists on what those experiences are, perhaps the, the context. Rather than having prepared statements, we thought to do it a bit more interactively with questions that we'll be uh, posing to you to really help shape and, and guide the discussions. I'm afraid I will need to uh, keep us focused a bit on the time, so I would ask us all just to keep about four minutes per, per, uh, per response. And if time permits, then we'll also be able to open up the floor first for some comments for uh, two of our development partners who have also been very engaged in this effort, and then also to, the, to all of you for more specific questions and, and uh, comments on what you've heard. So let me begin by introducing the, the panel. I'm delighted that we have to my right Ambassador Arthur Kafiro who is the Director for Regional and International Political Affairs of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Uganda, who will be speaking to us specifically about um, his country's experience in, Rwanda, in Uganda working with refugee management experience. To my left, uh, we have the distinguished guest from Morocco, Mr. Abdallah Ben Malouk, who is the Director of Multilateral Cooperation, also in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation from the Kingdom of Morocco, who will speak about how the Moroccan government works on promoting tolerance among the prison population. We had a bit of a preview from the video, but this will be an opportunity to delve more uh, deeply into that experience. Then I would like to also welcome Mr. Robert Kainamura, the first counselor of the permanent mission of Rwanda to the UN, who will be speaking to us about the Rwanda Youth Connect initiative. And then we have Mr. Stanlake Samkange, the Director of Policy and Program Division of the UN's World Food Program, who will also be sharing his insight on WFP is stepping up its support to South-South cooperation. As we mentioned following the video, this is really a mechanism, a tool to bring all of us around the UN together. And I'm, I'm delighted that we have a colleague from WFP to be joining this discussion. So if I can uh, start Ambassador Kafiro with you, just by way of a bit more of an introduction. You are the Director for Regional and Political Affairs in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And before that, I know that you've served in numerous capacities, both at home and abroad, including representing Uganda at the United Nations. Prior to your current duties, you were also the Chef de Cabinet of the President of the 69th Session of the UN General Assembly, Mr. Sam Kuteza. And it was during that session, actually, where the negotiations of the 2030 Agenda, Sustainable Development, as well as the Addis uh, Financing Agreement were concluded. If I turn to the question and the experience at hand, Uganda is currently hosting around 1.2 million refugees from neighboring South Sudan, a country which is faced both with conflict and, and famine. We've heard our Secretary General actually referring to the experience that Uganda has had, saying that Uganda has had an exemplary refugee policy in the past, and even today, faced with the largest refugee inflow of this past year, Uganda remains a symbol of integri integrity of refugee protection regime. So, Ambassador Kafiro, Uganda has likely drawn important lessons from your refugee management experience. Can you share with us and describe the main features of this initiative? And what has the country, and how has the country taken steps to share this knowledge attained with other countries in the South that are facing similar refugee management challenges? And as you're sharing your response to us, do you actually think that the model could be replicated elsewhere in the South? Thank, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair, uh, very much. Um, once again, I'm, I'm extremely grateful to be here uh, to speak and share Uganda's experience on refugees management. Um, I'll start by, by saying that our experience in um, handling refugees predates the New York Declaration um, that was adopted uh, by world leaders, and it also predates the 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development, where world leaders committed themselves to um, leave no one behind. What we have 
experience in Uganda is interesting in that um, from a 64,000 number of refugees sometime back in 1964, right now as we speak today it's about uh, 1.3 million. And the refugees keep on, um, the refugee influx continues with about 500 arrivals every, every day. But in Uganda, we know from experience that no one chooses to be a refugee. And um, it's because of this that we have um, adopted uh, this uh, position because we recall very well that during our troubled past, many Ugandans, including many of our leaders today, were refugees in neighboring countries, but far beyond that. Therefore, we strongly believe that every person must be treated with dignity and kindness in their times of need, especially when they're in a refugee situation. In Uganda, this solidarity has been codified into policy, whereby refugee protection and management is integrated into the National Development Plan, as well as the UN Development Assistance Framework within and with an annual budget allocation. We have responded to the refugee situation by placing refugee protection into the National Development Plan through what we call a settlement transformation agenda, which is a five-year plan on refugee protection and management. The implementation of this approach and the rights afforded to refugees thus operates as a solution that provides refugees with prospects for dignity normality and self-reliance. The needs of host communities are integrated into the refugee response just as refugees are integrated in the development plans. Because it is linked to the national development plan, it allows for strategic investment of the human humanitarian resources available. For example, during the emergency response, infrastructure development is carried out that is in line with the national development plan. For instance, schools and health infrastructure constructed in places are done so that nationals will have access to the similar facilities. But in a snapshot, I would just like to share with you the Ugandan approach uh, to this uh, refugee. Government registers refugees and gives them identity uh, documents that allows refugees to access services. These include uh, identity cards. So Refugees can freely access SIM cards and other um, um, items that can help them lead ordinary lives. The policy allows refugees to attain self-reliance, and this is done. One of the measures is allowing them to work, uh, which facilitates their contribution to the delivery of services in settlements where they also live. We have refugee teachers, health workers, and others in settlements that are assisting in the delivery of services. Refugees are also allowed to operate businesses within settlements, as well as in nearby urban centers. As, a, as an example, we have um, a refugee uh, settlement in a place called Chiriandongo, where we have a South Sudanese uh, man who has opened a bakery and employs both refugees and nationals. That is an example to game. The delivery of services is also integrated with the national service Refugees have access to schools, hospitals, and other services as nationals without discrimination. The, the, the Ugandan approach, uh, which we call the, the model, we find and consider it as a win-win for host communities as well. Not only through improvement in infrastructure in their areas, but also vocational schools developed in the area for the youths benefiting both communities. As far as the um, efforts that have been made to share our experience, I'll start by uh, informing um, participants that in June this year, um, the, the President of Uganda and the UN Secretary General co-hosted a solidarity summit on refugees in Kampala. The summit was um, organized in, in close collaboration with UNHCR. Participants in the summit came from far and wide, and it presented an opportunity for delegations to see for themselves for the first time on our experience and the model. Arrangements were made to take delegations right to where the refugees live, 
and they had an opportunity to meet with refugees, host communities, service providers, and really see how the model is working. But even prior to the summit itself, we had uh, hosted uh, delegations from Malawi, Tanzania, and Ethiopia to learn firsthand how we are approaching the refugee uh, situation. As far as the summit is concerned, we are indeed grateful for the support that was extended. Uh, over $400 million was pledged, and a website with information and data on the, on the Ugandan model is available and is updated weekly. That site is um, ugandarefugees.org, and I would encourage as many people and, of course, uh, countries of the South to visit and see for themselves what um, our experience. We have embraced a partnership, particularly with the UN, uh, UN United Nations, in addressing this situation. Um, as government, we are, we are grateful to the U UN country team, and I'm, I, I recognize uh, uh, Ms. Rosa Malangu is here. She heads the team who have been very supportive with other partners in, in ensuring that we can continue uh, implementing this, this model. Mm -hmm. We believe that the approach that we have taken can be replicated over the world uh, by other countries. However, in order for countries to be able to, to replicate the model, it's important that the, uh, the resources are made available for these countries because it is, um, it is very um, clear to us that in order to meet the immediate needs of the refugees and the long-term needs of the refugees, but also the host communities, resources need to be available. So for the model to be replicated and to be um, 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 used by others, I think it will be important that resources are available so that it's an incentive and as a catalyst so that other countries in the South may, may adopt the same, same, the same model. So with those few comments, I'll be, I'll be happy to take questions later on. Thank you. Ambassador, thank you very much also for very clearly laying out the approach your country has taken to what is a complex and challenging issue, but really starting from that principle and approach of solidarity and dignity and bringing it into the national development plans bringing it into the budgeting, the services, the opportunity, and also flagging the lessons that you cited on the resources and, and the partnerships. I think all of that is very important and really uh, an opportunity for further learning about the experiences and how it can be applied in other contexts. Since you mentioned the, uh, the role of the, the UN as, as a partner to this, I am delighted that we do have the resident coordinator, resident representative of Uganda here, uh, Ms. Rosa Malongo. If I can just ask you uh, just for a few brief remarks just to complement uh, the experience that we've just heard uh, from the perspective of how the UN is also supporting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me start off by congratulating you for this very timely um, event that comes um, for us in Uganda and definitely um, honored to share from the UN perspective um, what are some of the opportunities that there are to, to, to share and learn. Let me start off by saying that um, the number one thing that's important to note, the only reason we were able to, we are able to innovate and respond is because the government of Uganda has a very clear vision. So having a clarity, um, a vision, they have the National Vision 2040, which is extremely clear. Um, about leaving no one behind, about an integrated response to risk, um, regardless of whether they're human um, or created by Mother Nature. Um, they have a, also a very clear vision in terms of uh, partnerships, be it with uh, the United Nations, um, diversity of member states, and the private sector. Um, and they have a very clear vision about risk management to be able to, to meet their goals. So number one, um, the, the reason why we're able to do this is clarity of vision from the national perspective. If I may, um, three things that we saw from the UN side that has allowed us to respond. Um, the first is the fact that, um, as Ambassador Kafedo rightly said, the Ugandan approach predates international recognition. And it was very important for us as the UN to recognize that. 
And so we realize in studying and listening that Uganda's values of Ubuntu, our shared humanity, is actually what leads this to happen. And they explained that in the old days, if you left one kingdom to another, you were welcomed, given land, and became a citizen of that new kingdom. So it's very important that as the UN pursues the New York Declaration, the SDGs, the new way of working and everything else, recognize indigenous approaches, recognize indigenous cultural values, because that is what is informing what they are trying to do. The second thing that was very important for us and that we want to share as a lesson is that because the government of Uganda had this approach, we, the UN, were able to sit down with the World Bank and come up with a joint strategy, which you know is uh, pretty difficult to do in several countries. So we have a joint strategy, which we call REHOPE, Refugee and Host Community Empowerment Strategy. So between the World Bank and the UN, that allows us to contribute to the government's national settlement transformative agenda. The third thing which I think is very important is data. I know we've been talking about um, innovation and technology. I want to emphasize the importance of data. Um, we helped, um, as UNDP, the government of Uganda, and I invite you all to have a look at it, create a baseline study of how much the government of Uganda spends hosting refugees. It's an average of $351 million a year for a developing nation. That's very important. So the data baseline now exists for us to be able to go forward. The World Food Program did a study on how the refugees are generating income and impacting the, the economy. And we realized that in the 12 districts hosting refugees, the refugees bring between 92 to $250 annually to each district. So this is a positive economic impact as a result of the policies that were shared there. I will conclude by making reference to what are some of the challenges that we hope will become opportunities. Number one, the ambassador clearly said we need a development approach to these districts. In the UN system, we separate peace building from humanitarian from development. One of the biggest things that we had to do as the UN in Uganda was to make sure that we responded and delivered as one. And we had to reassess what were the information that we we're making available to who to make sure that they could invest. And so I'm really delighted to share with you a product that we did with the Ugandan Investment Authority. These are economic profiles of each of the districts hosting refugees. So we don't showcase them merely as humanitarian hubs. We showcase them as places that deserve development today, urgently, and that standpoint. The second thing from that standpoint is the issue of domestic resource mobilization. Again, here Uganda is doing a lot on that. We follow the uh, Addis uh, Ababa discussions. We look forward to learning from others. How can we make domestic resource mobilization work. So those were the, the key things that I wanted to, to highlight and to conclude by thanking you once again for having us here and inviting you all to come and visit us in the Pearl of Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much for the complimentary remarks, which I think also really, again, reinforces that notion of the, the vision and the alignment, but also the, the data and, and the many partnerships that you've outlined. Uh, both from your presentations is, is a key for success, but also a key that can be learned from in, in looking at the replication of these kinds of experiences on the, in other country contexts. Let me move now to uh, Mr. Ben Malouk, who I introduced at the beginning, but the Director of Multilateral Cooperation from Morocco. Um, as we heard and saw in the video, M Morocco has ado adopted really, I think, a very interesting and unique approach to counter-radicalization strategies uh, with various measures and also to counter and to prevent violent extremism. And in that particular context, the government of Morocco together with UNDP and very much supported by Japan has been focusing on different concrete measures which aim at prevention of radicalization within the penitentiary environment. Again, this is quite unique. We already heard that there's many different countries that are seeking to learn from this and very much looking at the different experiences of de-radicalizing high-risk inmates and very much also the successful reintegration into society through the promotion of tolerance, religious counseling, training by peers, and skills development. We also know that Morocco has really been a driving force of South-South cooperation in Africa with many groundbreaking agreements which have been recently signed. So in that context, Mr. Ben Malouk, if you can share with us 
Do you think that your country's experience could be of interest to other countries which are facing similar challenges, and to what extent is it both replicable and scalable? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the organization of uh, this meeting. Uh, I would like to say that it's a pleasure for me to be here with you uh, to answer your question. I would like, uh, before that, to say a few words uh, uh, about the context that favored the uh, implementation and the success of this project of cooperation uh, between uh, the UNDP and Morocco with the financial support of Japan. And I would like to say a few words about the national policy uh, in this area. The, um, the uh, Moroccan policy in terms of uh, uh, prisons or uh, it uh, is a result of uh, uh, a, a, a constant uh, uh, will of the king, uh, his majesty the king, uh, with uh, regard to rehabilitation of the prisoners uh, as a human objective uh, based on uh, the cardinal principle, which is that uh, uh, every citizen uh, must have uh, his freedom and dignity, also based on uh, the uh, program of uh, rehabilitation and reinsertion of uh, the prisoners uh, through a, 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 a training that allows them to uh, reintegrate the social life. The government, through uh, the general, uh, general uh, directorate of uh, uh, prisons, um, has uh, uh, led a reform, a re-reform of the the, pri the prison systems in, uh, in Morocco, uh, based uh, and in conformity with the principles, uh, international principles, the promotion of the culture of tolerance, uh, preparation of uh, the detainees uh, for a better reintegration in the social life, the um, uh, security and modernization as well uh, of uh, the prisons within a context of uh, the uh, uh, increase of violent extremism. extremism uh, a very clear importance has been given to uh, the um, uh, to uh, help uh, the uh, prisoners uh, um, avoid uh, this radicalization by uh, training them to um, have jobs that could uh, generate a revenue. Uh, also, holding constructive debates with the, the detainees uh, with the help of religious uh, counselors in order to counter the radical discourse, as well as uh, uh, holding uh, cultural and social activities. Uh, the action of the prison administration is supported by the the uh, Foundation Mohammed uh, VI uh, for the rehabilitation of uh, uh, detainees of uh, prisoners, uh, as well as the civil society and other departments uh, um, in charge. Uh, thanks to this uh, policy, uh, Morocco uh, is uh, recording the uh, lowest uh, uh, percentage of recidivism in uh, Africa. Um, in, uh, this, in light of this, uh, the uh, program of uh, rehabilitation that uh, the uh, UNDP uh, is uh, um, sponsoring uh, with the help of Japan. The first phase of this cooperation is uh, centered on two uh, important axes. Uh, first, the uh, socialization, uh, education, and the uh, uh, the uh, awareness uh, of uh, the uh, prisoners uh, uh, to um, prevent them from falling victim of radical uh, um, discourse. Also, uh, the help of uh, religious uh, counselors in order to rehabilitate the prisoners. Morocco has achieved a, uh, uh, the results of this uh, first phase, and I can say uh, certain things about the subject. The uh, elaboration of a national action plan to promote the culture of tolerance within the inmate populations in Morocco. Also, the reinforcing of the experience in Morocco by international, uh, good international practice. Also, the uh, uh, awareness and the um, capacity building of uh, the personnel in uh, prisons in Morocco, which allowed to put together six units of production in, fir in four prisons, and especially in in uh, 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 letter uh, production uh, as well as other uh, 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 areas. 
the promotion of tolerance uh, has been experienced in seven uh, uh, prison establishments, uh, including two uh, women only prison, uh, which allowed for the selection and the training of 220 educators to allow for uh, to allow uh, which will allow them to uh, um, um, bring to awareness uh, uh, more than 200,000 uh, inmates uh, uh, in which is a, a first uh, initiative uh, taken by the rabita which is uh, the religious uh, institution in morocco uh, that uh, allows to have a better knowledge of religion in order to combat uh, extremism at the end of this uh, first phase of this uh, experiment, uh, we have noticed a remarkable uh, adherence uh, by the inmates to the activities of this project. And this is why we thought to uh, um, restart uh, this project in this uh, second phase uh, in 2017 with the cooperation of the UNDP in this second phase. Uh, we would like to involve the uh, private sector and the civil society and establish 30 units of production within uh, the uh, prisons, which is a strategy of uh, uh, commercialization of uh, products, uh, marketing products uh, made by the uh, prisons, uh, prisoners. Uh, um, in conclusion, this is uh, an experience that could be shared with other countries, uh, uh, especially within the context, uh, the context of uh, the Arab and African countries, uh, and it could be also enriched by, uh, by other experiences from other countries. The UNDP has a lot to bring uh, uh, by helping us in this uh, second phase, as well as uh, facilitating the exchange with the other countries with uh, with the, with regard to the reinsertion of uh, detainees uh, in the social life i would like to reiterate the uh, commitment of morocco to promote uh, a, a solid there uh, solidary and uh, um, uh, efficient cooperation with the UNDP. All the projects uh, implemented uh, in uh, Morocco uh, have uh, a South-South cooperation component. These are projects uh, that are um, ready to be shared by uh, interested countries. Morocco is ready to share this experience uh, with uh, the interested countries. Uh, like uh, one of the panelists uh, said, uh, the mobilization of uh, financial resources is important. The first uh, phase of the project that was financed by, uh, by Japan uh, does not go beyond uh, $1 million. Uh, this is a project uh, that doesn't require a great deal of resources. Uh, however, uh, we must uh, um, lobby the uh, donor organizations, uh, organi civil organizations, organizations and uh, the private sector in order to uh, obtain these uh, funds. I would like to thank uh, the UNDP Morocco office uh, with the whom uh, we are working uh, in Morocco. And I would like to thank uh, Mr. President uh, for and uh, thank all his team for the work they're doing in Morocco in order to uh, help uh, Morocco and uh, in all the uh, cooperation project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for elaborating on, on that uh, experience and really the, the details and the, the actions that your government has taken first to, to learn from the, the experiences also and actually scaling this up within Morocco. I think uh, we talked about data before and, and already the kinds of figures and percentages and already that were shared gives a sense of how those lessons have been developed, how it has taken forward to scale up within the country, and then how this is also useful for other countries that are thinking about replicating this to those contexts, taking into account, of course, the, the different national realities. I also would like to, to flag, I think, as we said at the outset, the, the issues and the opportunities for South-South cooperation involve so many partners, and you mentioned the private sector and the civil society, and how those have co come into the efforts that uh, your government has taken in terms of this issue of the radical, uh, preventing radicalization within the prisons, I think is an ex excellent example. So thank you, Ed. I, I would also like to acknowledge the president's, uh, the president's uh, the resident coordinator for Morocco as well, and really that uh, this is such a valuable partnership and example to share. 
Thank you very much for your insights, and I'm sure there will be many uh, questions in the follow-up from this discussion and interest in that experience. Thank you. Let me turn now to our colleague from Rwanda, Mr. Kai Namura. Um, we know that Paul Kagame, the president of Rwanda, is very much a strong believer in the combined power both of youth and also information technology to resolve Africa's current socioeconomic challenges. He initiated something that is called Smart Africa Alliance and the Transform Africa Summit, which are two platforms that have really brought together African governments, again, private sector partners, and international organizations to accelerate Africa's digital transformations. Youth Connect is something that we've been also supporting uh, as UNDP since the beginning. It's really been a success in Rwanda as a multifaceted program seeking to empower young people and connect them with opportunities both in the public and private sector spheres and also civil society. Recently, Rwanda opened up its Youth Connect initiative to the rest of the continent and UNDP has been supporting the rollout and scaling up at the regional level through its innovation facility. We know that representatives of 14 African countries met in Rwanda last September to discuss what best practices can come forward of the Rwanda Youth Connect initiative. So can you share with us, from your perspective, what is needed in order for other countries to benefit from Rwanda's knowledge and expertise in this area and to apply the solution to their respective contexts? Th thanks, Chair, and thanks to the Ambassador for um, organizing this impor very important event. F for Rwanda, when the Smart, the Smart Africa uh, Youth Connect when it started, I think it was taking advantage of several innovations that were taking place around the world. And Rwanda, what they thought and looking at demographics, the young people, uh, we said, how can we take advantage of opportunities and possibilities presented by these innovations. And this is how actually the, uh, the, the Youth Connect came up. And the idea was that we need to connect the youth to the stakeholders. We need to connect the youth to their role models. We need to make the youth stakeholders on what is going on. But the easiest way was to use technology to reach them. And this is how the whole thing started in 2011. And as you said, uh, UNDP has been very instrumental. From 2012 to where we are today, we have seen an enormous progress and achievements on how the youth have been very impacted by the same technology in terms of reaching out their role models, in terms of reaching out or being connected to stakeholders in the government, in the private sector, in the civil society, so much so that the impact reaches the youth themselves. And the whole idea, the goals of job creation, entrepreneurship, has been impacted all through the technology. And in terms of figures, I think we're looking at 4 million people in Rwanda, the youth, aged between 16 to 30, that have been uh, through this Youth Connect. We're talking about um, off-job, uh, from the farms. Uh, the jobs that have been created in Rwanda is uh, over 4,500. So this has been going on and several countries have also come in. The countries we mentioned, there are several, and then also the, what we're calling now the, uh, the Youth uh, Africa Connect, the Youth Connect Africa rather, which is aimed at scaling up the, uh, the demographic dividend on the continent. Now, coming to your question on what they can learn from Rwanda, or what can be the best practice. I think the first, the starting point is leadership and the ownership of the idea. Localize it in terms of your systems, in terms of your policies, in terms of understanding it from up to bottom. I think that's very important. The other one is partnership. I think partnership is key, like we partnered with uh, UNDP. And in partnership, everybody wants to look at the win-win situation. UNDP would love to see if this uh, initiative is impactful to the people or has results. So if it doesn't have that, then the partnership is going to be shaken a little bit or you not get support. If it's private sector, for example, if it's civil society as well, they want to see the impact, they want to see the result of that particular initiative. 
if they don't see that, then the partnership we're talking about is going to be a little bit shaky. So it's very important to have um, impact-oriented, action-oriented uh, for this Youth Connect to be successful. And then the other one I think that we looked at are the policies, is to make sure that uh, the policies are youth-friendly youth-friendly in such a way that it fits into the objective and goals of the Youth Connect. So Rwanda also looked at that and I think has been one of the reasons as to why we've been successful. We had to align the policies to the objectives and goals of Youth Connect to impact the people. And also we have to look at the programs. Programs are key in the Youth Connect. You know, programs for the youth, you have to identify them, especially those programs that fit into the goals, into the, 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 the objectives, job creation, skill development, gender, innovation. So you have to identify those particular goals and then align them with the Youth Connect objectives. I think with that, it will be very easy for Youth Connect success. Um, short of that, then uh, you will have, you know, kick-ups here and there, and um, I think that's what we've been doing in Rwanda, and uh, we are where we are because I think of uh, benchmarking on those few elements. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that experience from Rwanda and certainly the issues around youth as well as ICT were also quite a bit, bit of discussion last week, so I think this was quite a good connection on that. Just reflecting on the experiences that we've heard, which are quite diverse into the context on the one hand between Uganda, Morocco, and Rwanda, there are certain commonalities. For example, in thinking about how to translate these to other contexts, we have the issues around leadership and the national vision. We have how is this actually localized to the, the national or to the country level in the local context. The issues around partnerships, data, impact, and goals, resources. And also I noticed that a common theme throughout is also very much the issues around livelihoods. And we know the importance of that also for the experience sharing also around the 2030 agenda. So I think we have, even with different contexts, some of the lessons learned on how this can actually be scaled up and applied to a different context with some good lessons that, that really cut across these different contexts. Let me turn the floor now to a uh, very much valued and important uh, UN partner who you have already heard in terms of the role in some of these contexts uh, from WFP. Mr. Samkange, uh, you've dedicated your career really to leading humanitarian organization, fighting hunger worldwide, delivering food assistance in emergencies, and working with communities to improve nutrition and build resilience. You have uh, both field experience and headquarters experience coming into this discussion. If you can share with us, uh, in a global context of rising country demands, how is w WFP stepping up their support to governments through South-South and triangular cooperation? And how, in your experience, can South-South cooperation support the achievement of Global Goal 2 by 2030? And as a partner of UNDP on SMART, do you believe that the tool may actually help lift up efforts to foster new South-South cooperation partnerships? Thank you very much, uh, Chair, for the, those questions. Uh, also, let me express my thanks to the government of Uganda for organizing this meeting together with UNDP. I used to be a member of the UN country team in Uganda, so I'm very pleased and really appreciated the, the presentation and the comments, also of the resident coordinator. Um, we're very pleased as uh, WFP to be part of this platform uh, and also express our appreciation to UNDP for its openness and allowing us to be part of this platform. Based in Rome, we also have uh, FAO and EFAD that have similar platforms, but uh, for us, we, we very much value being a part of this platform uh, and appreciate the openness and partnership. It also, I think, helps uh, bring UN agencies closer together. When we, we work with FAO, uh, it tends to be you look very deep. You take one sector and you look very deep. But working actually with, on this platform with UNDP, it helps to bring the multi-sectoral aspects uh, much more into play. You can't achieve SDG 2 on its own. Uh, you can't achieve any SDG on its own. And so a platform like this that has a variety of experiences that span uh, 
sectors, I think, is very important. And it's why we particularly appreciate that. And we hope that those who may be looking at the platform for answers or issues on other things will see some of the things we're, we're doing and recognize the, the, the a contribution to those uh, elements in food security that we wouldn't otherwise, a linkage that we wouldn't otherwise have made. So we think that's very important. World Food Program had a policy on South-South cooperation passed in 2015. It's part of all of the work that we do now, uh, and it's very much uh, the spirit in which we, we work. Uh, essentially, we, we focus on, in a variety of ways, but uh, the most visible are through several centers of excellence, formal centers of excellence, particularly in Brazil and in China. We have another one um, uh, on, on, the, on the way. But those are very illustrative of some of the challenges and some of the uh, uh, that, that we face, and I think that we all will face in moving South-South cooperation forward. In fact, if I go back to uh, what Achim Steiner said when he, he started, what's next and how do we move forward? Uh, actually, we got really focused on South-South cooperation with the Center of Excellence in Brazil because many countries were interested in Brazil's experience in school meals. They have a great school meals program linked to many other sectors, and uh, countries got very interested in that. We, as a, an organization focused also on school meals, uh, also recognized Brazil's experience and wanted to be a bridge to sharing that with other countries. But the Ministry of Education in Brazil is not set up to do international cooperation for development. So they didn't have a way of sharing the experiences that they have, not just on school meals, by the way, but on zero hunger in general. Uh, they're, they're used to being a recipient, but not set up to share experiences. And so actually, the engagement with WFP, the Center of Excellence, was to help the government of Brazil find a concrete way of sharing its experiences. And that is effectively the role of the center. There are over 40 countries have visited. The vice president of Cote d'Ivoire is visiting next month with uh, several ministers. It's an engagement on the government's part as well as on, uh, on, on our part. But it's one of the, the, the challenges. So uh, for us, we see two challenges. One is how do you help countries access best practice? How, how, do, how do you understand, if you have a particular problem, which of the 100 other practices out there are useful. So they come to us and say, you know us, you know those practices, help, help us identify which countries we should be talking to, and then help us work with that country to build that relationship. Uh, so I think that that's a critical role that we're expected to play. But the second is help countries share their experiences. Brazil makes a quite big investment, not just what they give to us, but what they invest in all of the visits. Other countries are interested in doing uh, similar things. How do they share those experiences? And, and I, I think that these are, these are two really of the, the biggest challenges uh, for us and why the structures of South-South cooperation that Shadik mentioned and that Achim Steiner mentioned and that you're working on are really critical because we do need to move. And the biggest risk we face is the challenge of expectations. So you see practices out there, you see things you'd like to engage on, but uh, can you really, is the support going to be there to engage? It's not just because you see an interesting practice on a website that you can incorporate that into your work and your, your policies. And so we're very enthusiastic to be part of the platform and interested also to work with all of you in how we ensure that we're, we're able to help countries deliver the South-South support that uh, is on offer. Thank you. Thank you so much. And let me just say also, as UNDP, we're also very enthusiastic that you're a partner on this platform. Thank you also for elaborating on the challenges, but also the opportunities that come through this integration of the cooperation across the goals and the lessons and the opportunities through South-South.
As you might hear, we're being encouraged to leave the room um, increasingly uh, forcefully. Yes, thank you. Um, we were hoping to hear, have a moment uh, to hear from Ms. Yoko Watanabe and then also Mr. Agarwal, two development partners, one from the UNDP, uh, the, the Jeff Small Grants Program, which we heard a bit about, and Mr. Agarwal is from Brock. I'm, I have to give our apologies. Unfortunately, we won't be able to, but I hope this conversation has been of benefit and also to share some of those uh, experiences. And Ambassador, it's been a pleasure for us to co-organize with this. If uh, you have any closing remarks, uh, I think they'll give us one minute if you allow. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Colleagues, thank you again. Let me uh, again extend my uh, thank you to the, the panelists for sharing this very rich set of experiences. A lot of insight, also a lot of information provided for the follow-up and learning more about these. Thank you.